The story of St. Philip's School is the story of a neighborhood jewel, one that has faithfully served Crafton and its surrounding communities for 100 years and counting. Before there was a St. Philip School, there was a St. Philip Parish, so storied in its history that it predates the Diocese of Pittsburgh itself. The area that today is Crafton was originally settled by the Seneca Indians, one of the six Iroquois nations. One of the first white men to own land in the area was General Edward Hand. Hand's name is familiar to many St. Philip School families for the blue marker along Steuben Street. It commemorates Hand's Hospital, built in 1777 to care for wounded troops from Fort Pitt. Made up of logs, the hospital was the first federally run hospital in the nation and was thought to use cannons as protection from Indians. There were 11 blockhouses around that hospital to protect it from the Indians. And uh, when they were building the athletic field down there, they discovered many instruments that the doctors had used old-fashioned instruments, and of course they knew they had been used for the soldiers. They brought the soldiers from Pittsburgh down to uh, Crafton to recuperate. By the early 1800s, Western Pennsylvania was no longer a frontier, and German and Irish Catholics began immigrating to Pittsburgh in large numbers to seek work in the mills. 200 miles away, in Emmitsburg, Maryland, Sister Elizabeth Ann Seton founded the first order of sisters native to the United States, the Sisters of Charity. In 1810, the pioneering Elizabeth opened St. Joseph Academy, which would become the prototype for the American parochial school system. Back in Crafton, Philip Smith, a wealthy lawyer from Philadelphia, purchased a large section of property from Edward Hand and leased it out to tenant farmers. Ten years later, Smith donated roughly 1.6 acres of his land to establish a Roman Catholic church and cemetery. Completed in 1839, the small brick church was the first church erected in the area and the only Catholic church between Pittsburgh and Steubenville, Ohio. It stood in the center of a cemetery, one that still exists today, at the corner of Crafton Avenue and Steuben Street. Because the Diocese of Pittsburgh wasn't formed until five years later, Bishop Kenrick traveled from Philadelphia to dedicate the church. He named it St. Philip after its benefactor, Philip Smith. When the Diocese of Pittsburgh was finally established in 1843, St. Philip was one of only seven churches listed. In 1851, the Chartiers Coal Company built the first railroad in the area to carry coal from the mines under the present-day Chartiers Country Club to the Ohio River where it could be loaded into barges. It was the first step toward what would eventually become a booming railroad town. Between 1863 and 1870, James S. Kraft, a prominent attorney from the Pittsburgh neighborhood of Oakland, purchased 250 acres of land in the Chartiers Valley, including much of what is now modern-day Crafton. His plan was to establish a town along the Pittsburgh and Steubenville Railway, which he served as president. But James died in 1870 before he could realize his dream. His son Charles would be the one to eventually establish Crafton in 1882, using much of the land he inherited from his father. Over at St. Philip, Reverend James Canoy was now pastor. In 1887, Father Canoy built and opened a small parish school with the Sisters of Charity, believed to have been erected at the base of Backbone Road. Seventy-five children of all grades attended the school, and no tuition was charged. But the school only lasted five short years. It was forced to close during the recession of 1892. In 1893, Father Canoy was succeeded as pastor by Rev. John Francis Regis Canavan, who later became the fifth bishop of Pittsburgh. But it was a young priest by the name of William Charles Kelty, whose impact on St. Philip Parish and its surrounding communities would eventually endure for decades to come. Father Kelty became St. Philip's pastor in 1898, and for the next 55 years, 
he would dedicate his life to a complete renewal and rebuilding of the parish. Sister Anina M. Fox graduated from St. Philip's School in 1933. She became a Sister of Charity in 1937 and the school's 13th principal in 1958. In the beginning, Crafton was not very Catholic. Most of the people uh, were Protestants. And of course, uh, that made it hard too in the neighborhoods because they, it seemed like there was a lot of uh, people who didn't understand the Catholic religion. And they would be hard on the children going from, to and from school. There was a lot of friction. And of course, I think Father Kelly did a lot to break down that uh, idea of separation of the Catholics and the non-Catholics because most of the people in Crafton knew him and liked him very much. When Father Kelty first arrived at St. Philip, the congregation was steadily beginning to outgrow the small church in the cemetery. In 1903, Kelty broke ground for a new church building. The church was dedicated by Bishop Canavan on February 6, 1906, and seated 800 people. In an article about the dedication that ran in the Chartiers Valley Mirror, St. Philip was described as the most beautiful church in Allegheny County. Though Kelty was deeply proud of his new church, written histories of the day also describe him as looking with troubled eyes on the children of his parishioners as they trudged up the hill to public school. He therefore set his sights on opening a parish school, which was christened with much fanfare, in 1915. Having invited back the Sisters of Charity to staff the school, Kelty even had a convent built on church grounds. The total cost for the school and convent was $80,000. And of course, when Father Kelly built this new school, it was quite an event because it was written up in the newspapers how tremendous this school was with the marble halls and the marble, a lot of marble in the uh, window sills and the spacious rooms. And uh, of course, that was unusual because most of them were just wooden floors or wooden halls. And this was uh, quite an event. So. It did a lot to help to bring the community more together and have people understand each other because there were a lot of Protestant churches in this area. As you well know, there still are. And um, it, was just, it was just a time when things were uh, integrating, I should say, more. People understood each other a little bit better. A newspaper article from 1915 describes the impressive interior features of the school, which was widely considered to be the best Catholic grade school in the Pittsburgh Diocese. The school is not only a beautiful building, but a practical structure as well. The woodwork is oak, and in many places, marble lines the wall. In the basement is a great auditorium, which will be used for club meetings and for the children to play basketball and similar games, and for entertainments. In the school are 11 rooms, a beautiful library, a principal's room, and a small parlor for the teachers. Everything which could be put in for the comfort of the children has been installed. It is two stories high and every classroom has a sun exposure for some part of the day. Perfect ventilating apparatus has also been installed. During the school's fledgling years, it charged no tuition and enrolled roughly 200 students in grades 1 through 8. Around that same time, a garage was built behind the convent, and the now famous angel statue was erected overlooking the courtyard. A cement volleyball and handball court was placed near the school, where the cafeteria building stands today, for the children to use at recess. Sister Benina Doran presided as the school's first principal, assisted by a faculty of 10 fellow Sisters of Charity. To fully appreciate what it was like to have been a student at St. Philip's School during its early history, it might help to first understand what it was like to simply be a child of that era. When Sister Anina started first grade in 1925, many of the roads we know of today did not exist. The most common means of transportation were trains, streetcars, and your own two feet. Vendors like the Iceman came around in horse-drawn carts, and there was no legal minimum age for when a child could start working. 
I remember up on the, the corner of North Linwood and Ewing, there was a pump. And everybody went to the pump and got cold water in the summer, took it home, and made lemonade. That was one of the favorite things that we had was lemonade in the evening made with the cold water because you didn't have ice. The ice man came once or twice a week and he had a truck and would uh, he'd chip off. He'd say he wants 50 pounds or 75 pounds, whatever. And the uh, children would all stand around the truck as soon as he came for a little chip of ice. They didn't have much of it in those days. That was a treat to have a piece of ice. And also the, mil the uh, milkman and the bread man came in a wagon pulled by a horse. And it was a big day when they got a truck and brought the, uh, that was seven Baker Brothers. It, they were called Wonder Bakers. And they used to bring that truck around after a while. And of course, that was a big event. Anything came on the street was a big event because there weren't that many things to take up our time. Mostly what we did was uh, listen to the radio and that was a treat usually Friday night because Sunday, Saturday night you had to get up for mass on Sunday so you couldn't stay up late to listen to the radio and Sunday night you didn't stay up late because you had to go to school Monday. Richard Hanley grew up in Ingram and graduated from St. Philip's School in 1939. My, my life was very, very uh, different from from what you might expect. I uh, started delivering newspapers when I was nine, and about a year later, I got a job over in Kadori's Drugstore. Uh, I was about 11, 11 or 11 and a half years old. Started working in the drugstore, uh, serving people ice cream and, and things from the soda fountain. Uh, I worked there from seven o'clock at night until 11 o'clock every night, five, Monday through Friday, and then Sunday I worked there all day from 11 o'clock in the morning to after church to uh, 11 o'clock at night. But this was after having delivered morning newspapers to the West Prospect Avenue crowd down in Ferrywood, which is part of Ingram. I, I worked all of West Prospect Avenue and down and to the right in Ferrywood Avenue, and then then I would go over to Wingap Road and deliver two or three papers over there. That went on until I was about six. Oh, I guess I was pretty close to 16. A typical school day for children like Anina and Richard began at 9 in the morning and ended at 3.30 in the afternoon. Most of the students walked home for lunch, unless they lived in places that were considered too far away, like Crafton Heights or Ferrywood in Ingram. Children from these neighborhoods had to pack their lunches and eat on picnic tables set up in the boiler room. Because several roads were unpaved, especially the shortcuts, most of the children wore boots to school throughout the year and changed into their school shoes in the cloakroom. By the 1920s, attendance at the school had grown so large that Father Kelty broke ground on an addition. Completed in 1929, the new building housed six new classrooms a gymnasium, and, if you can believe it, a bowling alley in what is now the art room. School enrollment climbed to roughly 800. So anyhow, this is the site of the pump that served this whole school with one tin cup. We come out here for a recess. We'd be out here for 15 minutes and everybody would be thirsty. And we'd all avail ourselves to pumping puffing up water and, uh, and uh, drinking it out of the common tin cup. It was amazing. School life was different in many other ways back then as well. Uniforms were not required at St. Philip's School until 1990. Instead, children wore their better clothes to school, like a shirt, tie, and slacks for boys, and a nice dress or blouse and skirt for girls. Before a St. Philip's student could graduate and move on to high school, it was required that they pass a county exam, a mandate the Sisters of Charity teaching at the school took very seriously. We used to have exams that the teachers gave us, but the big exam was uh, in the eighth grade. Uh, we, most of the children had to go to public school because the nearest Catholic school was either St. James West End or St. Luke's Carnegie, and a lot of them, it was a depression at that point. The depression was at its worst, and not too many of us could afford to go to school. 
in a Catholic school. So most of us went to Crafton High or to Langley or to uh, Ingram. Ingram had a two-year high school. So uh, before you could get there, you had to take this county exam. And when we went into the eighth grade, we knew that this was facing. Each test was two hours long. And you had to have a test in uh, arithmetic. It was called arithmetic then. English, geography, and history. There wasn't much science. We had some science, but not, not like they have today. And these tests were two hours long, and it was came at the end of the eighth grade, and Sister Mariana, who was our teacher then, used to keep us after school almost every night till five o'clock. And she would drill in the English and the math and so on. And none of the parents objected. St. Philip's School saw enrollment dramatically increase at the onset of the baby boom era, which occurred roughly between 1946 and 1964. The baby boom era got its name for the rash of babies born in America in the years following World War II, when American soldiers who had left for the war as young boys still living at home were returning as young men, eager to move out and start their own families. Gail Gillis, who attended St. Philip's School during this era, recalls what the school was like back then. I know we had large classes, like this was a first grade. When I came here in the third grade, it was over where the computer room is. And uh, I guess the first, second, and third must have been on this floor. And we probably had 40 at least or more in, you know, our class. In Gale's day, the school auditorium, which today houses the preschool and after school programs, was still in its prime. When I was here, it had a stage, which was really nice. And uh, the walkway was still there, but there was no wall. It was just a wooden walkway that went back to uh, the wall. And the boiler room was there. And the stage, you would exit either in the front of the stage or through the boiler room. And But later on, they discontinued the stage, took that out, and then they had three classrooms. There were many performances on that stage. Christmas play. Instead of having anything at church, you know, he did the Christmas play and uh, assemblies. Uh, Father Kelly would come over at Christmas time and he'd have boxes, small boxes of candy lined up along that uh, walkway, and everybody in the school got candy from him, and you know, he'd bless them, and that was it for Christmas after the play. If you're asking who preceded me that affected me and my position here at St. Philip, probably Father Kelty, whom I did not know, who was here for over 50 years. Father Kelty Hall, of course, is named after him. He was a, a person who started the school, basically. The second school, because there was a previous school in the 1800s that uh, had it closed because of, there was a depression in the country. So he came and he was the one who was the builder, who saw a, uh, an opportunity for the, this area to sponsor a school, and he, he oversaw its growth. And so looking back at your, all these wonderful stories of Father Kelty. And he would come out at the recess and hand each child that came up to him a cookie. And when they were gone, other times he would come out and give them dimes, like John D. Rockefeller used to do. And that's my fondest memory of Father Kelty. Well, I think I understand that he would always give uh, coins to the children so that they would have enough money. Some children were very poor, so they could buy uh, lunch money. So he would give them, like in those days, a dime or a nickel. Father Kelty used to come out uh, during the noon hour and play handball with, uh, with the students. And whoever was selected to play with them got a dime, whether you won or you lost or whatever. You just played. And also, he used to go up to the different uh, neighborhoods and gather up the children put them in his car and take them down to the ballpark. And he used to sit in the ballpark and he had a newspaper and he'd put it over his head like this and watch the game because he always sat in a place where he faced the sun. And he well, you'd see him sitting there with the newspaper and all the kids were around uh, playing. And then after that was over, he'd take them for a treat somewhere, buy them an ice cream cone or some candy. One of the stories I heard, I guess it would express his personality, 
It doesn't have to do with the school, but his personality. Uh, as one day he was uh, invited uh, to play against the seminarians, he and the other priests at St. Vincent Seminary, where, where he went to the seminary. And uh, he, it was his turn to bat, and the bases were loaded. And um, they were behind the seminarians by one run. And one of the priests came up to him and said, try to get a walk. And he'll you know, drive in the tying run that somebody else will you know, then be able to you know, maybe hit the, the winning run in. And he turned to this priest and said, I don't walk, I swing away. And he swung away. And the person told me this story, said, when you go to St. Philip, swing away. You know, do what God wants you to do. Don't stand back and just walk, okay? And this was told me by a lay person who, who knew this story of Father Kelty. So he was well known in our area, not just in St. Philip, not just in Crafton. And that's good advice. At the beginning of 1953, Father Kelty was 91 years old. Concerned that he could no longer care for the school and parish with the same vigor he had shown for the previous 55 years, Kelty resigned as pastor. He was permitted to continue living at the rectory as pastor emeritus for a parish he had served so successfully for so very long. God called Father Kelty to himself two years later, in June of 1955. Father Kelty was succeeded by Father William J. McCashin, an experienced leader who had founded Our Lady of Lourdes in Burgettstown and served as its pastor for 37 years. Like Father Kelty before him, Father McCashin maintained a strong devotion to the school, which continued to flourish during his tenure. By now, the number of children attending the 9 a.m. Sunday Mass was so large that the basement of the church had to be modified for services. Well, it was necessary because the congregation became so large that we couldn't handle them. And at one time we had two masses. We had a mass upstairs and one downstairs. So that was the main reason for remodeling the basement. And that was during uh, Father McCashin's term. It was also clear that a third school building was now desperately needed and in 1954, six classrooms were dedicated in addition to a modern cafeteria. Well, I designed a rectory for Father Kelly. I designed a new addition to the school. We had a six room and a cafeteria. I designed a KSC hall that was two wooden churches where they put side by side and then converted into one building. I also remodeled the basement for uh, services and put in restrooms. Throughout the 1950s, 60s, and early 70s, St. Philip's School was easily among the largest and best Catholic elementary schools in the Pittsburgh Diocese, with enrollment soaring to 1,200 students in grades 1 through 8 for many years. Even with the addition of the cafeteria building, there was simply not enough room and eventually the auditorium had to be divided into three third-grade classrooms. Other homerooms included what today is the gym alcove, the science lab, the wireless lab, the library, and the computer lab. Simply put, there were children everywhere. Mrs. Catherine Huth, who today is the school's computer and enrichment teacher, graduated in 1961. Well, I, you know, went to St. Philip's in the 50s and graduated in 61, and the culture in the school was very different then. We had many, many families that had 8, 9, 10, 11 children in the family, maybe one almost in every grade. We had a large population of students that came from Crafton Heights and from Broadhead Manor, which was a huge housing project on the west side of, of the Crick. And St. Philip's had its own buses and its own bus drivers in those days, it said St. Philip's School, in fact, I have a picture of one. And um, the drivers made, in fact, two trips to some of the locations. That's how many students were in the school. If you can imagine that I can never remember being in a class with less than 50 in a room. Now that's 50 in a room, that multiplied by three rooms per grade level, and some grades even four. There was at one point a grade level that was split five and six because there were too many, they couldn't fit the children in. So they had one class that was five and six together. 
So it was quite different than it, than it is now, but just as lovely. During this time, at least two dozen Sisters of Charity served on the faculty and resided at the convent. For the most part, the same teacher still taught every subject, and students of all grades remained in their home rooms throughout the day. The few extracurricular activities of this era were mostly made available only to boys. Girls could play basketball, but only boys could also sign up for the school choir or altar serving. For a brief time in the late 1940s, the school even had its own football team. One of the players was former state representative and St. Philip graduate Thomas C. Patrone. For many years, Patrone visited the school annually on school choice day and brought along a cherished team photo to share with the children. Father McCashin himself would visit the school at the end of each quarter to pass out report cards. And one of the highly anticipated events of the year was an annual art exhibit held in each of the classrooms. Um, there were not class masses in those days either. We went to mass on Sunday to the nine o'clock mass. Our teacher was there, particularly if she was a sister of charity, she was in the pew. You sat with all the children in your class and you were expected to pay attention even though mass was in Latin. Uh, the next day, you would be asked about the sermon. A lot of teachers had you write the sermon and turn it in the next day to show that you were not only at Mass, but that you were paying attention. And confession now is only uh, a couple times a year for the holidays. It was every other Friday for the entire school from third grade up. The girls went one week, the boys went the next week, and you just went over to church and sat in the pew and waited your turn. And that's just the way it was. We never thought anything above it, about it. It was very strict then. I can, I can remember at um, Lent, there were two blue candy machines in the cafeteria and Father McCashin would come on Ash Wednesday and put a piece of masking tape all across the candy machine because there was no candy for Lent. And there used to be a theater where um, the restaurant is now up in Crafton across from Wolbert's. And that was a movie theater, was the Crafted Theater, and the priests would go on Saturday and ride in their cars to see if anybody was in line for the movies because movies were not supposed to be viewed in Lent. So it was a different atmosphere, and children accepted that. They probably wouldn't accept that today. Maybe parents wouldn't accept it either. But it was just the way that we grew up and that we, we thought that was fine. In the spring of 1955, Enrollment at St. Philip's School was so promising that Father McCashin purchased a three-acre plot of land as the site for a future St. Philip High School. McCashin was forced to abandon his plan, however, when the Diocese of Pittsburgh decided to erect a high school serving the entire Chartiers Valley, adjacent to St. Paul's Orphanage in Oakwood. Named after Archbishop John Francis Regis Canavan, Bishop Canavan High School was dedicated on November 22, 1959. Meanwhile, the land Father McCashin had purchased for a high school eventually became the site of the current Crafton Park and swimming pool. The year 1959 also marked a significant change to the grand staircase in the original St. Philip School building. Well, one of the big surprises I know when we came back to school in September one year, and we did go back in September or August, was that, was that um, the school had been renovated and our beautiful two-tiered staircase was gone. We just had one set of stairs and everybody wondered where the other stairs went. Well, they went into the closet actually, but it was done because of fire codes and safety over the summer. They decided to um, close it off, but Sister Anina had told us that there used to be, where these steps go, it was a huge landing and someone sat there with a the piano every day, played the piano, and when she came to school here, the children would march into school, march up the front steps and these steps, both sets of staircases, to come into the school, um, marching with the music. So that was quite a, quite a thing in those days. And I know she was very sad when they had to close the staircase off, but it was done for safety reasons and it was really for the best. Sister Anina Fox became principal in 1958 and remained in this role through 1964. She also served as the choir director and was known to use an actual portable organ to teach her lessons. It would take six boys to carry the organ from room to room. Al Bannon graduated in 1961. 
So she recruited myself and some other boys in my class to be in the boys choir. And I was in the choir for the, the remaining five years of grade school. And then the next year when I went into fifth grade, Sister Nina became the principal here. So I thought, oh, I'm, I got it made now because, you know, she taught me fourth grade. I, I was in good with her in fourth grade and then I was in the choir, so I had it made. Well, that wasn't the case with Sister Nina, but no, she was, she was a wonderful person. And uh, it was because of her, actually, I ended up going into the seminary after eighth grade for two and a half years. And it was because of my education here, because of the sisters and the teachers I had here, and especially Sister Nina. Um, my brother Art and I, and actually my whole family, always had a very close ties with Sister Nina. What am I most proud of? Well, first of all, that I am, that God gave me my my faith in Him, my religious faith. Also that I am a Sister of Charity. I value that very much. And also the fact that He let me live in this country. I think this is, I think this was a great grace. And also, in this, where I am right now, to me that was one of the greatest values because I think that this is one of the most beautiful countries. And that, and my good parents, my good home, the church, the school, I love all of it. I value it all. McCashin's 13-year tenure as pastor came to an abrupt end in December 1966. On his way to purchase flowers for the Christmas altar decorations, his car overturned. He died of his injuries at Mercy Hospital the following February. McCashin passed on a parish that was in excellent financial condition to his successor, Bishop Vincent M. Leonard. But Leonard served the parish only briefly before being appointed the ninth Bishop of Pittsburgh in 1969. In his stead, Monsignor Robert P. Garland took the reins and went on to serve the parish for the next 17 years. A former Irish boxer, Garland was said to have hands like a steel worker and a commanding presence from the pulpit. One former teacher fondly recalls that during his sermons, he sounded just like Gregory Peck. A former student adds, his sermons were hands down the best I've ever heard. By 1968, St. Philip Parish had grown so large that a decision was made to split the two congregations and open Ascension Church in Ingram. Around that same year, the 9 a.m. Children's Mass, which had been a staple of every school child's life for half a century, was discontinued. No longer needed for services, the church basement was eventually remodeled into a parish hall and dedicated in memory of Father Kelty. In 1968, Sister Jane Catherine Farrell became the 16th consecutive Sister of Charity to serve as principal of St. Philip's School. Before Sister Jane Catherine came along, the longest tenured principal was Sister Jane Elizabeth Smith, who served for seven years from 1936 through 1943. Sister Jane Catherine would serve for nearly three decades, through the boom years of the 70s, the lean years of the 80s, and the turnaround of the 90s. All who knew her spoke of her infectious smile, her hearty Santa Claus-like laugh, her grandmotherly love for the students, and her unwavering faith in St. Philip's School. Sister Jane Catherine was my principal. I loved her. She was tough, but also very caring and loving. Like she would, you know, let me give her a hug or whatever, and she, yet she was, you know, make sure your ducks were in a row, all that good stuff. So she, I enjoyed her. Uh, we had a basketball game here my second or third year. It was my idea. I told the coach, you want to raise some money, have a faculty team basketball game against the eighth grade team. And we did. Our cheerleaders were teachers in the school. Three of them were nuns. Sister, and I'm going to reveal their names to you now. Sister Jane Catherine. Sister Claudia and Sister Louise DePaul, the eighth grade teachers. Now, Sister Jane Catherine is, to me, a very special person. She was the most loving, understanding um, person, very trusting, uh, believed that you were, you were always going to do your best. And so because she believed in you, I think people did do their best. She responded to you so 
as a matter of factly, you know, you, you um, never, you always knew what she was thinking because she was very honest with you. And if she wanted to tell you something that you were doing wrong or right, she would tell you. She was such a loving person. I don't know any other way to say it. Just the sweetest woman in every part of her. I loved her. Sister Jane took the reins when each grade numbered easily 150 students. I remember when I was in first and second grade, there was more than 50 kids in my homeroom. There were three homerooms of all first grade and second grade. My father decided to go to graduate school at Penn State and he was taking a leave of absence from his job. So we were gonna to move to Penn State for one year and my mom was really, really worried because she wanted me to come back to St. Philip's School. But at that point, there was a waiting list and if you left the school, you weren't allowed to come back. So my mom has told me the story to me a bunch of times about how she had to go to the principal and then she had to go to the pastor to get special permission for me to be able to leave for the year and still be able to come back for fourth grade. At the time, St. Philip had also developed a speech and debate club. When I was in St. Philip's, I was in forensics when I was in the middle school. And when we were in seventh and eighth grade, we had a team that participated in other local Catholic schools and tournaments and stuff. We were, we were pretty good. Um, there was a, a bunch of kids who, you know, moms would pile us into the cars and we'd drive to other schools. Back then, the powerhouse team in the league was St. Stephen's in Hazelwood. St. Philip finished strong in many tournaments, often even giving St. Stephen's a run for their money. In 1970, Mrs. Patricia Hantush joined the faculty. She would go on to become St. Philip's longest tenured lay teacher to date, faithfully serving the school for nearly four decades. In the 1990s, the Diocese of Pittsburgh introduced the prestigious Golden Apple Awards, which recognize outstanding performance by Catholic school teachers and administrators. In 2001, Pat Hantush became the first of seven St. Philip teachers to win the Golden Apple. The lunch ladies of the day, Peg Lepsig and Ann Schiller, were known for making popular homemade lunches from scratch, including fresh baked goods. A student favorite was the pizza burger. Outdoor recess was now held in the parking lots across from Angel Way. Handball was still a favorite game among the older students, while Red Rover was the preferred choice of the younger set. Ponchos were stylish during these years, and the girls also enjoyed braiding the yarn at the end of their ponchos during recess. In 1969, James Titus joined the faculty as a fifth grade teacher, but would move on to become a school legend teaching seventh grade for 11 years. He would write on the chalkboard uh, that, that were the covers for the, any classroom that didn't have a coat room. He'd write all of his notes, anything whether we were learning about the Constitution or any events in U.S. history. We would come into class, he would, we would copy the notes, and then we would listen to him go through each one line item by line item. And it made you passionate and want to know about history, about the wars. And one of the most exciting things that I'm sure many people remember are the mock trials that he had done. For his innovative approach to teaching, Mr. Titus won the coveted Catholic War Veterans Teacher of the Year Award in 1975. While it may be difficult for today's school families to imagine, the St. Philip School basketball teams of yesteryear played their home games in the school's infamously cramped gymnasium for over seven decades. Competitors dreaded playing St. Philip at home, and the school's cheerleaders dreaded the thought of causing a forfeit. So back in 1979, when I was a cheerleader for St. Philip School, you had to be in seventh or eighth grade to be a cheerleader. They didn't have the nice program that they have today where you could start in kindergarten and then work your way up from the PE to the JV and varsity squad. But something that was quite interesting was all of the games at St. Philip were played in the gym. And something that was so funny was at that time we were required to stand behind the black 
line that you see that was the edge of the court. Well, that space, when all is said and done, is about 18 inches, and our coaches, of course, didn't let us touch the mat because we had to look professional, and the referees and the coaches didn't want us to even put a toe past the court line. Therefore, we were within about a 10 inch space doing all of our cheers and chants and all of our movements and cheering for the players, having a great time, but we did it in a 10 inch space. Um, it was a wonderful advantage playing in that small gym. And um, in fact, <laughs> I remember in, in seventh grade, there were some warped board, floorboards and, um, and we knew they were in the one corner, of course, we would try to avoid them or just make sure we pass the ball and not try to dribble too much. And, you know, not that, um, you know, that was our, not that other teams would constantly lose the ball out of bounds there, but there was, there certainly was advantage. The size, the loud, how loud it would get from the, uh, the cheerleaders kicking the benches and just people in there. They actually had special floodlights that I never saw until the, like, game light. These special floodlights, they just lit up the place in a whole different, um, gave it a, whole, a, a different uh, flavor. And uh, it, was, it was a great place to play, and um, very, very tiny. Okay, all, all three of um, my kids played basketball here. Um, our oldest son, Sean, played, he just played JV. Brian played um, JV and varsity. He loved varsity because Buzzy Mixon was a coach and he just got along great. And then my daughter played JV and varsity, and, um, uh, Bob and Amy Shantz, uh, father-daughter combination, coached them and they were just fantastic. But um, when my daughter was in eighth grade, they went undefeated. They were 20-0 and 0, and they went, uh, they were the section champs plus diocesan champs because nobody could beat them that year. They were just incredible. And, uh, and I think little Brian and his brother Mason are both playing basketball now because of their dad and because their dad played here the whole time he was here. School uniforms had yet to be introduced, but Sister Jane Catherine was not above pulling girls out of class and having them kneel in the hallway to see if the hems of their skirts and dresses touched the floor. In the early 1970s, the Pittsburgh region was employing close to 300,000 in steel and manufacturing trades. A decade later, that same industry was hanging by its fingertips. With the collapse of Pittsburgh steel industry in the 70s came widespread joblessness. By January of 1983, unemployment in the metropolitan area hit an astonishing 17.1%. Between 1970 and 1990, the city proper lost a full 30% of its population, largely due to people leaving the area to find work elsewhere. With the serious economic downturn came a serious enrollment downturn at many area Catholic schools, many of which would not survive. Like-minded in their determination to preserve St. Philip's School, Monsignor Garland and Sister Jane Catherine looked for every means possible to cut costs. To save on electric and heating bills, they closed down the middle school building, as well as the school cafeteria, and huddled the students into as few classrooms as possible. From the years of plenty, when average grade size soared as high as 150 students, came the years of want, when grade size dwindled to as low as 15. Just as the city of Pittsburgh had to reinvent itself to survive, so too did St. Philip's School. Peg Rabley and her husband Gerard relocated to Crafton in 1979. They already had three young children and a fourth on the way. Investigating the local Catholic schools to decide where to enroll their children, they were initially impressed by the modern facilities and higher enrollment of St. Simon and Jude School in nearby Scott Township. But their minds were changed when they met Sister Jane Catherine. Sister Jane Catherine had been here for many years and uh, the kids loved her, but she was very strict. She had discipline and uh, nothing stopped Sister Jane. Um, she just did things. She just went ahead and did everything um, in the school. It, it was just, it was a very small uh, kind of a family atmosphere. There was one of each grade, as I said, and um, 
We were concerned about that though because we didn't want to see St. Philip's close. And some of the neighboring schools were larger. In fact, we came to see Sister Jane to kind of talk to her about the school and she said, um, we said, you know, Sister, we're concerned because it's small and we're just starting our children. We don't want to be pulling them out. We see that Sister St. Simon and Jude rather is large, a much larger. What do you think? Oh, honey, she called everybody honey. Oh, honey, our school's fine. We're going to be here for a long time. Well, she was right. By this time, Kathy Huth's six children were also starting to attend St. Philip. Peg Grabley, who was a new mom in the school, Al Bannon, who I had gone through St. Philip's with, had children in the school, and I had children starting the school, and we were very concerned. So we um, got together and approached Monsignor Garland, who also was concerned about the declining enrollment, and he was 100% behind whatever efforts we wanted to make in order to boost the enrollment in the school. The first thing that we did was um, start a kindergarten, because that way we could sort of bring new students into the school and uh, some of the areas um, like Montour did not have kindergarten and people were paying for private kindergarten anyway so this was a good inroad. Also because of the declining enrollment the cafeteria had been closed up and it looked to the community like the school was slowly fading away so we revitalized the cafeteria, reopened it, we opened the kindergarten to I think our first class was only 13 students but it grew rapidly from Part there. Part of the strategy was to hire a teacher who could make a name for herself to get young families excited about enrolling their children at St. Philip. So I went to Point Park College when I was 34 years old and I met a friend who is from this area and her friend was a teacher here at St. Philip and said there was going to be an opening in kindergarten. So I came made an appointment with Sister Jane Catherine and I was a little nervous, but I've only been a Catholic school person all my life. I started out at St. Martin's grade school, Canavan High School. I was the second graduating class from Canavan. And I took classes at Duquesne, went to Point Park, and I said, well, I want to teach in a Catholic school. And so I came up the driveway, and I looked at the school, and I said, I like this school. So I went into the stairway, and what I found out later is, that's the spot where people get the feeling. And I started walking up the steps and I thought, oh, it feels so good here, it feels warm. I, I like this. And Sister Jane Catherine, jolly Sister Jane Catherine was standing in the hallway and she says, well, hi there, what's your name, are you Sharon? And I said, and I was very formal, yes, sister, because that's the way I was taught. And so she said, come on in. So within a half an hour, I was the new kindergarten teacher at St. Philip. A cultural shift was also beginning to occur in the 1980s. The number of families with two working parents continued to rise, as well as an interest in early childhood learning programs. Um, then Peg also had a very strong interest in early childhood and she wanted to begin a preschool, which was tremendously successful. We started a preschool just a once a week any open, it was free, um, and it was called Meeting Jesus, and we had 30-some mm, kids, and so I taught that, and we would just do two hours of religion, religion, Bible stories, a little craft. I had several other mothers help me who volunteered to do it. Mrs. Rogers, Miss, the two Miss Rogers' mother was one of them, and um, we enjoyed that. So we, we saw that there was an interest in a Catholic preschool program, and that people were there were people in the area to come because there were other very active well-respected preschools in the area but not catholic ones it was there were very few catholic at the time sister jane and i used to go to a lot of diocesan meetings in regard to it and we'd kind of meet and share ideas so the following year when my daughter was in kindergarten uh, we started a preschool a four-year-old pre-kindergarten for three days a week monday wednesday friday just in the morning so that I could be with my daughter when she was finished with kindergarten in the afternoon. And uh, we had 24 students, and most of us volunteered to do it. There were four teachers, me and three other aides, and uh, we had two classrooms, and we just went back and forth and changed classes, and we taught, you know, different pre-kindergarten skills, letters, sounds, numbers, colors, Spanish, art, um, science, with a science table, um, they loved that. Singing, of course, music was a big part of it, and religion. And many, many parents said, you know, we forgot 
we don't say grace at home. And, and our little one came home and said, Mom, we don't say grace. So the parents brought back that they really learned a lot from that, and it brought religion kind of back into their family. And that was our hope, that people would see the value to a Catholic preschool. The final component of the preschool came together in 1990. And at that point, we started a, an afternoon class of four-year-olds pre-kindergarten. Um, and I did not teach that directly, but I oversaw it. And then um, Terry Fitzgerald, um, a girl from the neighborhood who was also a teacher, I had taught her son. And she said, I would like to start a three-year-old program. And I said, okay, they're a little young. But she said, oh, I think we could just do it four hours a week, Tuesday and Thursday, for two hours at a time. And, and it would be something um, that people would enjoy and, and wouldn't take them away from their family and their mom too much. So she started that um, on Tuesday and Thursday. So these classrooms were used, you know, all throughout the day, really. With the preschool program now feeding pre-K and the pre-K program now feeding kindergarten, enrollment in St. Philip's School began a critical turnaround. The main thing that we did was to dispel the rumor that St. Philip's was closing because people don't want to enroll their children in a school that they think is not going to be there for them the entire eight years. So this it helped tremendously to give people confidence in the school. They began enrolling their children again and the school started to boom again with the help of Sister Jane Catherine and Monsignor Garland. In June of 1995, the beloved Sister Jane Catherine took ill and was forced to resign. Sister Judith Kraft took over as principal but then left the school midway through her first year to care for her ailing father. Sister Geraldine Marr was director of novices for the Sisters of Charity, as well as director of their retreat and renewal center, when she was called upon in January 1996 to cover for Sister Judith. By the end of that school year, Sister Judith had chosen not to return. And at that point, it had become all too clear to St. Philip's faculty and pastor that in Sister Jerry Marr was the kind of keen, forward-thinking leader the school would need to carry it into the 21st century.